All right. Ready to rock and roll. Welcome to the February edition of the Ras Califax Center members meeting. Uh, our president is John Nan Greaves, and you can reach him at presidenthalifax.ras.ca. For other members of the board and for the special committees, you can certainly go to contact us at, at our own website at halifax.ras.ca and contact us that way. And we certainly have a YouTube channel. If you've missed previous meetings or uh, for those perhaps that only attend part of this meeting and not the whole thing, it will be posted within a few days of, the, of today so that you can view the full meeting. And there are other special presentations there as well. And uh, of course, I'm sure this is how most of us felt over the last couple of months, waiting for those dear skies to clear a photo that we acquired off of um, Facebook somewhere. First, we'd like to acknowledge that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples first agreed with the British crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between the nations. Also, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that Ras Califax Center, along with every other of the 30 centers, uh, do believe in and practice inclusivity and diversity. All are welcomed here at the center and all of our events, regardless of age, disability, gender, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, ethnic origin, color, nationality, national origin, religion or belief, or sex and sexual orientation. We are opposed to all forms of unlawful and unfair discrimination. We also would like to have all members know that there sh should not be any discrimination or harassment at, uh, at or consequent to any of our Halifax Center meetings and events, be it in person or in cyberspace, and that you report it to any member of the board. There is zero tolerance for this type of behavior, and we are here to ensure that all members enjoy the RASC experience. So, so here's our agenda for today. Just completed the welcome. We will have the photo montage uh, by David uh, Hoskin. Uh, David will be joining us from home today. And we have two special guests. One is Gary Welsh, who will be talking to us about Gravity's Way, Shredding Galaxies on a Laptop as well as Pat Kelly, uh, who'll be speaking to us from home as well, which is the sun is not an average star, the earth is not an average planet. Uh, Paul Heath will be presenting a special uh, edition of his Food for the Soul in an ode to Terence Dickinson, who passed away this past week. And David Hoskin will be up again for what's up in the February skies, and then presenting news from the board. So, David Hoskin, are you prepared for your photo montage? Yes, I am. You just All right, should. go for it. Okay, everyone see that? So, <clears throat> as you might imagine, um, there's a large number of images of the uh, comet um, C2022 uh, E3 in this uh, month's uh, Montage, but we have a few other uh, images as well. So, this is an interesting one that uh, it's a composite that uh, Roy Bishop put together. Um, the top panel is, is a picture that uh, he took of the uh, comet, I'll call it Z the ZTF from now on, um, from his uh, window in Avonport. And about the same time, Mike Boschat tried to take this picture from Halifax. And you can see uh, in, uh, on January 21st, uh, the top image is one that Roy took uh, from his uh, uh, house in Avonport. And the bottom one is a picture that Mike Bosch took from Halifax and Mike was trying to see the comet and he couldn't. Uh, so this just shows you the uh, impact of light pollution on, on something faint like, like a comet. Uh, Judy Black sketched uh, on January 27th, uh, this uh, image of the comets, faint blur uh, up in the uh, top uh, part of her, her eyepiece view. 
and Jerry Black at the end of the month uh, uh, got this rather nice uh, view of the uh, of the green comet, and you can see the the uh, green color coming from the uh, ultraviolet light excitation of uh, diatomic carbon. Uh, Mike Boschot. Uh, caught this view of moonrise uh, above Dartmouth on uh, January 28th. And on January 11th, uh, he had his solar scope out and got this hydrogen alpha view of the sun with a, a few sunspots quite prominent and some uh, filaments and a nice prominence there. Uh, he, through a white light filter uh, a bit later, <clears throat> the image is really large sunspot was transited into the disk around the middle of the month, but there, the sun was pretty uh, pretty active. There were um, easily half a dozen sunspot groups uh, visible in, in a white light filter. And this is uh, an image of uh, a sunspot that uh, Mike took on the 22nd of January, trying out his uh, new um, um, ZWO uh, monochrome camera uh, using his, uh, a solar telescope looks quite promising. Uh, and uh, Mike did finally get a, at the end of the month, get a, a nice shot of the, the comet uh, in the skies over Halifax. Uh, Barry Burgess uh, took this uh, image uh, at the end of the month. Uh, again, the green is very prominent, and uh, you can see uh, the, the very short. Uh, uh, tail and a hint of an ion tail there. Uh, Dave Chapman was busy looking at the comet through his telescopes and he sketched uh, this view at the, on January 27th in Dartmouth. And he took this picture on the 28th in Dartmouth. So lots of us were, were enjoying the comet. Uh, Dave has also been uh, active uh, <clears throat> viewing and sketching uh, the sun. And this is a, a composite sketch, if you will, of uh, what he saw through his uh, white light filter on his uh, 114 millimeter reflector and uh, hydrogen alpha with his uh, Coronado PST. And uh, Lisa Anning got uh, a nice shot of the uh, comet from her backyard. Paul Gray um, took this image of the uh, ion tail is quite quite nicely illustrated here uh, and uh, dust tail very short and very broad. Um, the, Paul was tracking on the comet so that's why the stars are appearing as uh, uh, smeared lines um, but that gives uh, an indication really of how fast the comet's moving. Uh, I took this picture of the moon at the start of the month. One of the few clear nights we, we've had at the start of January. And at the end of the month, uh, I got this uh, hydrogen alpha image of the sun. Uh, notable here is this line of sunspots that are transiting across the uh, solar disk. And uh, I've been doing a little bit of deep sky. Um, I uh, like this one because it, it contrasts a, a, a fairly spread out open star cluster, Messier 35, with a compact star cluster, NGC 2158, and they're in the, it's quite pretty. They're both in the same field of view. And uh, this is my, uh, one of my shots of the uh, comet on uh, January 22nd. Uh, Pat Kelly, uh, image this uh, view of the comet on the 28th. And Blair McDonald, not to be outdone, uh, Blair uh, took this shot of the uh, of the comet uh, also near the end of the month. And, and again, the uh, ion tail is quite prominent and very short dust tail. Um, I think this is the last picture. It's Brian Smith that uh, took this uh, photograph on the 24th of January, um, and it's it's notable because because he got uh, not just the uh, the comet's uh, dust tail, but uh, also what what's called the anti tail, um, which uh, 
is uh, visible when the comet passes through the uh, plane of the ecliptic. And uh, that's it for the photos for uh, January. Not, not bad at all, considering uh, how few good nights we had. Uh, okay, so I guess the camera's looking at me. And uh, I'm not used to this gear. Um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce today Gary Welch, astronomer, professor emeritus at St. Mary's University. And believe it or not, 38 years ago, Gary was my first astronomy prof when I took an intro astro course at St. Mary's. And um, it, was, uh, it was like nothing else. It was like a giant delicious layer cake full of science. And he put all kinds of extra astro icing on top of the cake. And it changed my view. I grew up in a very conservative family. And this changed my view of Earth and the universe and a whole lot of things, changed my life in so many ways, including 37 years in the RASD and all of the things that that has led to. Uh, Gary taught for many years here at St. Mary's undergrad graduate courses, as well as doing his own research mostly on galaxies, in particular, S0 galaxies. Page 330, page 330 in the Observer's Handbook, if you're interested. But he is, uh, he's much more than an astronomer. Actually, he, he allowed me to just wing this introduction, not providing any information, I had to make it up. And he just cautioned me not to provide anything of interest to the RCMP. Therefore, the intro is short. So apart from, from astronomy, he is also an avid square dancer, birder, gardener, traveler, hiker, camper, and canoeist. So please join me in welcoming Gary Welch, man of the world and the stars, as he presents Gravity's Way, Threading Galaxies on a Laptop. Oh, technology is great when it works. <laughs> When it doesn't, oh my God. So I'm taking a poll, just, be, just out of curiosity. How many people here know anything about Python? Python, uh, yeah, the, the program, one, one or two? A few, okay, excellent. Uh, 18 months ago, if you'd asked me what Python was, I would have uh, kind of snake or, you know, like, like thing, or maybe Monty Python. Never heard of the computer program. It is, it is. I found that out. <laughs> well, I'll let you be the judge of that. It's the search for having fun, which I've managed to do but I don't style myself as a Python expert. <laughs> I, I learned what I had to, to do what I wanted to, and that leaves gaping holes. Uh, I'm doing scans, scans. Yeah, in fact, I, scans is, I think, booking me for a course in life and space for their spring semester, which I think means first week of, starting first week of, Jan, uh, of May for six weeks. I don't know yet. So it's not official until I see the, the uh, schedule. Then. That's what I've been told. It's either going to be at Woodlawn, uh, Baker Drive, Baker Drive, or uh, Clayton Park. One of those two uh, parkland auditoria. Another question. How many people lost their power this morning? Oh, am I the only one? No, I'm in uh, Lawrencetown uh, on the Moscadavid Harbor grid. Nine o'clock. Okay, so I'm assuming everything is copacetic here. Do I have to look at this bar across my, the top? Okay, so let me start here. So I got a short, um, 
PowerPoint presentation, kind of overview of the whole show, and then we'll look at some simulations. Uh, so I guess um, many people already know because of our chat just a minute ago that Python was named after, after Monty Python, not the snake. Um, we will be do, doing more today than shredding galaxies, but we will shred a few galaxies. <clears throat> Just so we're on the same page, uh, I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes talking about what you'll be seeing, the background of, behind what you'll be seeing. But it's called an n-body simulation. And what that means is that you have a number n of point masses or very small spheres that do not collide that have mass and are affected by gravity. And uh, the, the case of n equals one is not very interesting, so we'll kind of bypass that. But for n equals two, you have two masses oh, shown here who can attract each other gravitationally along the line of sight. The force of attraction between the two is given by this equation generated by Isaac Newton. Uh oh, what's happening here? Now what do I do? Do I of gravity, which will determine the force that each particle pulls on the other? Maybe maybe I will try to my vocal cords. <clears throat> um, so the, the situation for n equals two is so easy, you can write down a little equation that will predict exactly where the two particles go in the future. For n equals three, you can't do that and higher. And the situation becomes rather chaotic. Um, for n equals two, the computations are trivial. You just solve the equation once. For n equals a larger number, you have more paired forces to deal with. For example, for n equals five, each of the five particles feels the other four attracting it, but that's times five. So you have 20 force pairs you have to worry about, which is close to the square of five, 25. If you had say 10 particles, each of those 10 particles would feel the force of the other nine times 10 is a 90 force pairs to worry about, which is very close to 10 squared, so 100. Hence the n squared problem. As the number of particles you have to deal with grows, the number of computations you have to deal with it grows very much faster. And that slows things down. And you'll see that in the simulations. I typically run the simulations with no more than five or six, 700 particles. I've tried it with a thousand, things are pretty glacial. But if I'm willing to walk away and have a coffee, come back later. Uh, that's the kind of thing you have to do. Um, the other issue is what I call jerkiness, which involves the, the fact that the simulations you will be seeing are simply a bunch of snapshots of the state of the system where the, where the system is at various time intervals separated by a chosen time step. Now, if I was simulating a, a cluster of stars, which you'll see in a minute, the typical time step will be a few years, maybe tens of years, hundred years, something like that. Not not really long. If I'm simulating a galaxy, the time step's probably more like a million years. And 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 what I mean is that the simulation shows the snapshots at various times, and hence the motion is not smooth to the eye unless the time steps are very small. But if they're very small, you have to do a lot of them to get where you want to go. So there's a trade-off there between jerkiness and just taking too doggone long to do too many uh, solutions of the n-body problem. And you'll see what I mean. Uh, to get a simulation going, what you have to do is, is define the initial state, by which I simply mean tell where all the particles are in space, an X and a Y and a Z coordinate, tell how they're moving, their speeds along the X, Y, and Z axes. And after you do that, you solve Newton's law of gravity for each pair of forces, add them up, 
for each particle. And then you use the second law of motion, the F equals MA, where M is the mass of the particle you're talking about. The force is the force of gravity. You've just computed the sum force for all the other particles acting on that one particle. And A is the acceleration of that chosen particle, which means how fast is the velocity changing? So what, to do, what you do to produce this animation is you jump a time, the time step ahead. And over that time step, you compute how the acceleration has changed the velocity. And so you use that change velocity to advance your particles. I'm making it, this is rather, more complicated than this, but it's essentially what's going on. So at the end of the time step, the particles are in different positions. They have different velocities. They have different separations, which means you have to redo the whole calculation again to get to the next time step and the next frame in the simulation. So it's a very computational, computationally intensive process. Um, now, let me see it once more if I can get rid of this test bar up here without screwing everything up. Hide floating heating control. Okay, I guess I, I guess I've done it. So what I had to do was to dust off a few basic science and math skills that I, I guess I learned in high school and first year at university. Uh, nothing really daunting here, at least for me, but I think anybody in this room could easily handle the math and the physics. It's not a big deal. However, the animations were a different process entirely. I had problems, big problems. Let's see if I can illustrate these problems here. There we go. So that's me a year and a half ago trying to figure out what the devil I did wrong and why aren't these particles moving around and why am I getting so many error messages? And it was a slow process, but I had having nothing better to do and being retired, I just, and also I should point out that in addition to the textbook I showed you in the first screen, there's lots of online help available to people like me and you, plenty, and I, and I benefited from that. Uh, I like this picture because it's kind of pretty, but it really is misleading because my laptop, which is indeed a uh, gaming laptop, something I had before I started learning about Python, is an alien, Alienware 19, eight, uh, 2018 model. Uh, it has an Intel Core i7, no big deal. Um, its clock speed is modest. Not embarrassing, but nothing to crow about. It, it has a very small amount of RAM, suitable, I think suitable for what I've done, but I might improve things by buying more RAM. What it does have is a solid state disk. And, and that's where the system is located. And I think that's probably helped me a lot um, rather than reading from, a, from and to a hard disk. Other than that, it's, Eight. It's more or less typical for a, a decent laptop. Nothing to crow about. <clears throat> so here's today's agenda. Uh, once more, I want to try to get rid of this bar. Doesn't take no for an answer. <clears throat> oh, well, I'll show you a few uh, images of real galaxies just to kind of set the baseline. But the main part of my talk is a stroll down gravity's way. Um, and if time permits, we'll talk about some interesting extensions of what I've been doing, uh, these, the movement from point masses to clouds turns out to be a big deal, and some ideas for the future. Hello, okay. Um, most of the white galaxies of the Milky Way are flat disks like us. Um, the disks contain gas, stars, and dust. You're seeing the dust uh, on the edge there. And these uh, objects are going more or less in circular orbits around the center. <clears throat> the center is occupied by a um, bulge in which the stars are moving randomly, much more randomly than in the disk. The disk is an ordered circular, nearly circular motion around the center, but the bulge is random motions. 
If you look at the disk face on, you see this uh, glorious spiral pattern quite frequently. <clears throat> the spaces between the spiral arms are not vacant. There are stars everywhere in this disk, but your eyes are being diverted by the bright young stars in the spiral arms. This, this galaxy does not have a very bright bulge, but it's there. Uh, by the way, you will not be seeing a whole lot of spiral structure in my simulations. Spiral structure turns out to be difficult to simulate, at least in my experience. Uh, other galaxies that aren't too far away, this one's in the Virgo cluster, <clears throat> are completely unlike disk galaxies. They are globular star clusters scaled up to hundreds of millions of stars called elliptical galaxies. They have no spiral structure, no essentially no gas and dust. They're big piles of stars. And what you're seeing here is a HST image of um, MA6, plus it's uh, some of its globular star clusters. So each of these little bit, bits here, oops, is a globular star cluster containing 100,000 stars or more. Now, there is um, a good deal of interest in how one creates an elliptical galaxy. And one mode of doing that seems to be to take two disks, like spirals, and collide them together until they go boom and all homogenize into one vast pile of stars. Just remember that. And then there are things like the mice, <clears throat> which are clearly bizarre. There are hundreds of these kinds of objects. Oops, let's go back here. Um, this, I guess, is a mouse, and I guess that's its tail. This is another mouse, and its tail needs some problems here. Maybe go to the ER and uh, wait for a couple of days to get your tail fixed, something like that. Then there's things like Hoag's object. <clears throat> um, this could have been a spiral galaxy, but there's a gap here between the spiral pattern, what's left of it, and the bulge. And this is a background object, which is, ironically looks like another version of Hoag's object. I don't know what it is. Maybe I'll just give up on this and put up as an A. Okay. Um, trying to advance the slide um, successfully. What do I have to do here? Okay. Um, when you're programming Python, you need a front end, something that talks to people and then does the uh, binary stuff with the operating system. And uh, I, I, knew, I found two choices. One is Spider, which I ended up using. The other one is Anaconda, which appears to me to be more in tune for uh, business applications. So I, I chose Spider. Turned out to be, a, I think, a good choice. So that's it for the PowerPoint for the moment. Now we'll look at some animations. So here's the spider front end. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm not used to talking a whole lot. <coughs> so it's showing in my voice. What you have here is a big panel for the code. So you write your code in there. And you have another panel called console, which is uh, the system's place where it can object or curse at you and send you error messages that are obscure and hard to understand. But it turns out to be very useful because you can also use it to uh, display information about your simulation, which you will be seeing some, some of that information. So, okay, uh, up here at the top are a bunch of programs lined up to, to view uh, with animations, starting more or less with the simple and going to the complicated. So I won't spend too much time on the simple, but I've got to show you my first success, eh? <laughs> so I'm really proud of this. So hold your breath and get ready for a shock. Ready? Okay. Check it out. They're both moving. You don't see very much. You see, no, not very much jerkiness. Look at that. They're both moving around a common center of mass. I figured it out how to do the basic idea of animating motion. <clears throat> but you will agree with me that the background is not exactly astronomical. So that was one of my next problems. 
make something that looks more like outer space. And you, as you'll succeed, you see here, my next, well, the next one I'm showing you, effort has succeeded. <clears throat> so here you see a, a, a three star system uh, and some reference axes, since you have a darn thing to refer to in the background, uh, a, a, a axis pointing towards X, an axis pointing towards Y, and one coming out at you, uh, Z axis. Uh, notice that report of the program is that the X and Y axes are 100 AU long, the time, steps, time step is about 0.1 years, and there they go. Um, I also found out through, I'm not quite sure how I remember finding this out, but your left mouse button can use, you can use that to change the view of the simulation where it's going. And you can also stop the simulation. I found this out months, uh, a year later and applied it to this program. Start it again. And something else neat that you can do. Let me, I, this bar getting in the way of my, I, oh, uh, never mind. It's not getting in the way. I want to just stop and go back and show you a way I've developed for, for showing where things have been. So I'm I'm asking it to show trails behind each of the stars, and this is kind of neat, at least at first. So the trails are are where the where the star has been every 20 time steps. And uh, this is nice if you're interested in looking back, but as you can imagine, if you have a lot of objects and a lot of time, things get awfully cluttered. So I tend not to use this neat thing, even though I, I was proud of myself for finding out how to do it, but that's history. So you won't see much of that anymore. Um, okay. So if you can do it for three, you can do it for a lot. <clears throat> so here's an example of a star cluster. Uh, and you will you will see over here a reporting of the kinds of stars that have been selected at random from a distribution of stellar masses and spectral types that is realistic in an astronomical sense. And there are going to be about 100 stars. Oops, I forgot to change to a new simulation, didn't I? Okay, here we go. All right. So I don't like the simulation because it doesn't show any B stars. I like B stars. What it shows you are the blue, the F stars, uh, A stars, the green are the F stars, the yellow guys, which are, you can probably you have to take my word for the color, are solar type stars. And then the little guys, the orange guys are K stars. The really tiny little guys are M stars. And um, let me go back and try to restart the simulation. Oh dear, what did I do? I, I didn't want to go that far back. <laughs> okay, just a second. Uh, how do I get my, oh dear, how do I get my screen, my icons back so I can restart Python? Hello, timeout. Python is an icon down there. It's on the screen, yeah. There you go. Yeah, spider, right. Okay, so here comes spider. Back up, back up in your face. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. No, this is real time. Real time, yeah. The laptop's running the simulations as, as I described them. I thought about recording things, but um, you don't have much control over pre-recorded simulations. So I thought, well, Show them how it is, what the heck. Um, okay, 
So let's try our, our star cluster. And I, my goal is to find at least one B star. Oh, no B stars. Try it again. First part of your code basically creating the virtual universe of initial objects and then it into it then Yeah, you create you create the starting condition. The state of this of the system at the beginning, and then you have a, a process for advancing time steps, recomputing Newton's law of gravity, and away you go. And the initial universe is the same each time or is it a random? Well, the initial universe is just an X, Y, Z coordinate system with a black background. So everything starts anew. But when we see those few hundred stars there, are they oh, different uh, each they time? They are different each time. Yeah. Well, not random, but there's a randomness in there. So, I, so I'm hunting for an a, a B star here and the system is um, not producing one, maybe I'll give up. Oh, I don't want to give up. Usually. Uh, yeah, oh, I'll do one more try. There's no B star, we're, we're gonna go on. Okay, we're gonna go on. They're, they're rare, I mean, B star just aren't a diamond dust. So, let's see if I can. So there it goes. Um, we can zoom in. I found I totally found out that you can use the right mouse button for zooming. This was just an accident. Notice when I zoom in and out, <clears throat> the size of the symbols don't change. So when you take a far zoom, things get a bit crowded because the symbols are the same size. And you may or may not like that. I don't. But but it enables you to see what's going on inside the cluster. And you can <laughs> you can spend a long time looking at this thing and wondering what's going to happen because since the startup is random within limits, I never quite know what to expect. And generally, I do specific ways I don't. So it's kind of fun. It's a new ball game every time. But let's get rid of this. Uh, moving on to bigger things. Oh, yes. Um, let me take a moment to give you a small challenge. So <clears throat> I wanted to, I wanted to uh, make a video of a real cluster. So I went to um, the internet and found the coordinates and right ascension, declinations, radial velocities, proper motion, yada, 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 masses, spectral types of a cluster to set up the initial conditions. Now, let me see if I can run this properly. So I've stopped the motion and there's your cluster. And the x-axis is now pointing towards increasing right ascension that way, increasing declination up. And the z-axis is going into the screen and that's increasing distance from us. So that's a snapshot of the sky, simulated sky. And you can see over here, this is my first hint to you, that the x and y axes are only 16,000 AU long. 16,000 AU, or on the sky, 42 arc seconds. So you're not looking at a big part of the sky here, a tiny view of the sky. And here are four stars, which you can see tonight if we're clear. Yes. You win a, I don't know, gold star if I had a, in the book. This is the trapezium cluster. I'll, I'll let it go now. <clears throat> um, typical of trying to, simulate real things is that you don't have enough information to do the job properly. 
we know where the stars are on the sky, but we don't know the depth of the cluster. Where are they along the line of sight? Yes, we have parallaxes, but the parallaxes are the same to within the quoted errors. Likewise, we have a very good idea of the radial velocities of the star along the lines of sight. Very accurate, but the proper motions, the same to within the quoted error. So you don't know the transverse velocities. So I had to make some educated guesses and I did the best I could. But it's an interesting exercise to try to simulate real life as much as you can. There are limitations. Okay, let's move on. Oh, here, I've done it again. I'm talking to you and I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing. It's my problem. I'm trying to look at the clock here. So if you, when you get tired, raise your hand and say, get out of here. Okay. So here's a kind of generic view of a single galaxy. Based on, it's notice the lack of spiral structure. That is the way it goes. Uh, there's a nice bulge though. And you can see that it is pretty flat except for the bulge. It's in the XY plane, very, very nice and flat. If you look at the, the way the bulge is behaving, you'll see one of my problems in action. That is to say, when you have a random collection of stars going this way and that way, <clears throat> how do you start them out in a kind of contained equilibrium configuration when you have no idea what that is, really. And so you'll see the cluster kind of breathe in and breathe out. Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make a decent bulge or elliptical galaxy that wouldn't go like this because I didn't start it out right. Yes, you are very. Nope. <clears throat> I wish I wish you were, but it's. I didn't think anybody would notice that. But what I do is I I set these stars in circular motions around the center, but I also give them small random velocities of in and out of the plane. Exactly. That's what's. Exactly. That's it was done there purposely. So that can be controlled. But anyway, there they are, round and round. And after a while, you say, okay, nothing's changing, no spiral structure, we're kind of bored with this. However, there is a spiral structure. This galaxy uh, a flyby of some other reasonably large mass, maybe another galaxy, small galaxy, big galaxy, whatever. And this will let's go through the hypothesis, induce tidal effects like the moon does to the Earth, two tidal bulges, you know, on opposite sides of the Earth. Maybe these tidal effects will draw stars out into a pattern, which their rotational motions will then swirl around into a spiral pattern, because the stars on the outside are moving much slower than the stars on the inside. You'll get this wraparound effect if you have a flyby. So let's so I looked at this and to see whether I could easily make something happen. So what you're going to see is essentially the same galaxy, but a small mass of about one tenth of its mass fly by, just to see what would happen. So there comes the small mass. Uh, it's just a point mass. I don't care about spiral structure in there. Uh, and you see the bulge is small because I've taken bulge stars and put them out in the disk. And these flyby is in the plane of the disk. So I'm making things optimal for a tidal effect, trying anyway. So it's flying by literally in the outskirts of the disk there, about a tenth of the salt of the mass of the entire galaxy. And you see a tidal effect beginning. You don't see a whole lot on the opposite side of the galaxy, which is kind of disappointing, but that's the way it is. So the first person to, to, to see spiral structure, say, or not. 
What? You see spiral structure? Well, well, well. Tell us earlier that the spiral structure is not real, that it's actually just the brighter it's starburst. Maybe a transient phenomenon. It comes and goes. Nobody really understands spiral structure well enough to be sure that it's long lived or short lived. Okay, great. We'll, we'll just watch this and. It's example to my eye. Seemed like there was as many stars going one way as the other. Oh, there that's true in both. But in the disk, they were all going the same way. In the previous one? Yeah. Okay. We can go back and check. I just was wondering whether the the flyby introduced more angular momentum into the entire system. And that's why you're starting to see a spiral structure which has a sort of a chirality. It certainly, or... it certainly would introduce angular momentum. Okay. Absolutely. I wouldn't mind seeing the previous one actually. Okay. I, I didn't while. catch that. <laughs> Do we have spiral structure or not? Or, or is it just spiral? Is it just high terms wrapping around? I'm not trying to switch. I'm just wondering. Look promising, but spiral structure is not. Spiral structure is difficult to simulate. So let's go back and check out the previous animation. See the bulge there. I tried to make a more realistic bulge, but but the stars in the disk are all going uh, for sure. They're going very close. Power of suggestion. <laughs> Didn't see it before. To me, oh. yeah. what can I do about this? We have a. Okay. What am I going to do? Turn on my bell. Am I good? Just step closer to this. Okay. How's that? Here yeah, are we. Are we all happy here? Okay, so let's go on. I don't want to take any more of your time than I have to. I love taking your time, but I, I realize I'm intruding. So now we're going to take a big leap forward in complexity and recall my suggestion that maybe one of the origins of elliptical galaxies are the collisions between two spirals or disks, if you'd like. And what you're uh, what you've got here, what you will see here, are two disks coming into contact uh, with negative total energy, which means that they are in bound orbits around each other. They will both have bulges. The bulges will transfer energy from one to the other. Um, and the energy will cause loss of orbital energy from for one of the galaxies, which will eventually merge with the larger one. Uh, and that energy will go largely into heating the bulge up, the bulge of the big galaxy up. Some of this may not be easy to see because we don't have enough time to carry the simulation to completeness. In, in other words, to not enough time to so, show a beautiful elliptical galaxy. But you'll get the idea, I think. And there will be a, re a recording here, ongoing recording of the time step, the amount of years since the beginning. Um, the jumps are, I think, two million years. And we will, if we have time, we'll go to a billion years. And you will also see in the far right a running commentary on the separation between the two centers of mass as they close in on each other. Oh, oh, okay. Oh. Uh, well, it probably is. Uh, how about... Um, how about um, one of these guys? Mute. How about mute? Yeah. So, so function, yeah. Give it a try. So 
before too many things happen, I just want to verify with you that there is a disk there with a huge big bulge and it's being invaded, if you'd like, by a smaller galaxy with its own little bulge and its own little disk. And yet there are Z motions in each, uh, in each disk. So we'll just kind of turn things around here. And let me, let me just show you the recording that's going on. So we're at seven, 70 million years, the frame ones in the 170s, and the separation is four kiloparsecs. The separation will be dropping as the two merge. I mean, and while they do, the most amazing things happen. I'm not cr trying to create anything here. It's just that this is the way it happened. But it's kind of cool. <laughs> and and what you get depends a lot on how you start. The orientation of the disks, how how much offset they are with each other as they fly by, the relative rotations of the two disks relative to each other. Are they both rotating in the same way or are they opposing? What's the angle? There's all sorts of variables there that I haven't really begun to explore. And they will all produce different kinds of effects. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> well, this is a years ago laptop. <laughs> it, it is indeed. It, 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 absolutely true. But you can see the jerk. There's a lot going on here, compute, computationally. And I can pause the simulation and just kind of walk you around to see the amazing complexity of what's going on. What gravity can do to two ordinary galaxies, maybe there's a tail. Could you imagine a blue tail going up to a yellow mouse? Well, I don't know, maybe. Why not? So as time goes on, the yellow bulge and the red bulge will intermingle and the the the, the oh sorry the the uh, particles that, the stars that were in the arms the blue and the orange will gradually become less obvious and you will see a central concentration of blobby blobby structure developing we don't have enough time to go through all of that i don't think well i'm let, let's see how much time has elapsed here so we're only 500 million years into the simulation, but the but the the separations, which started out to be 12 kiloparsecs, are now down to a kiloparsec or less. So things are merging, but it just takes time, you know. That's the way it works. So I I think I, I in view of the time, I will cut this off and show you one more, then we'll see where we stand. <clears throat> So imagine a disk galaxy with a nice bulge sitting there in space, minding its own business, not upsetting anybody, going about its life. And you'll be seeing an edge on view of this puppy as the stimulation starts. You know, ho-hum, no problem. I've done it again. There we go. And what should the wandering eyes behold but an elliptical galaxy coming down almost uh, dead center, but not quite, on top of this poor disk. Passing right through. And now we will look at the, what happens to the disk as a result of this passage. And I, I ask you to remember HOAG's object. Now I looked at this and I said, wow, but, but wait, see what happens, to, notice what happens to the disk. You've got a ring galaxy there, but after a few hundred million years, things start to be pulled in.
the elliptical is long gone. You, you, you can see it because it was almost a face on encounter, but it's way in the background. So this is what I find cool and unexpected. The ring reforms in a broader sense, uh, configuration that looks more like Hoag's object to me. Meanwhile, if you were to look at this thing on the edge, you would see a mess, kind of like a bowl. And this bowl will gradually become inhomogeneous and a kind of thick bar of mess of stars. And after the first couple of uh, ring appearances, everything kind of relaxes and you don't get any more striking configurations. So I thought that was kind of neat. And I think maybe I better stop. I have more, but I know you have more things to do than look at these simulations. So, And I do want to, to uh, if you have any questions, go for it. Now or later. Doesn't have to be now. Okay. Um, there's certainly an evolutionary process there. I would not be willing to say that every spiral will become an elliptical or uh, an S0. Many of them may. Um, it might depend on the environment around the spiral galaxy. If there are intergalactic clouds available, attracted gravitationally to the galaxy, that might sustain its life as a spiral for many, many billions of years. So it depends on the environment. If the galaxy, like in the Virgo cluster, if the galaxy finds itself in a cluster with many other galaxies, then interactions are much more frequent and things are rather violent. And therefore, if a galaxy loses its interstellar medium, the chances of it recapturing it are small because the interstellar medium will form the intergalactic medium in the cluster. And so this is more or less why you tend to see in modern, in modern, the modern period in cosmology, many more S zeros in clusters than you do in the field, isolated. There are very few S zeros in the field. There are a few, but not very many. Yeah, they were, they were real. They're, oh yeah, there probably, there probably were some evolution for sure. And it could very well be that spiral galaxies, the, the frequency, the collision frequency in the past was higher in general throughout the universe. And so there were lots of, lots more collisions, more frequent collisions, which would generate elliptical galaxies more frequently, but if you collide two spirals, you're not probably going to get a S0. You're probably going to get a star pile. And star piles, elliptical galaxies, are believed to have formed way back during the time when collisions between spirals are much more frequent than they are now. S0s are a bit of a puzzle. An isolated spiral can run out of gas. The gas uh, can be re is returned when stars evolve. They become red giants. Red giants slough off their mass. It goes back into the interstellar medium, and a lot of this accumulates over time. So why doesn't the galaxy regenerate its its star making capacity? But some of them don't, possibly because the mass is blown out of the galaxy by supernova explosions, possibly because a galaxy, a, a neighbor galaxy, comes by and some of the interstellar matter is siphoned off and possibly for other reasons that I'm not aware of. <laughs> it's complicated. And that's one of the interesting things about S0 galaxies. They are a puzzle. We can explain sometimes why they evolve, but I'm not confident that we understand the full picture. Sure.
Okay. Ah, sticky collisions. If we had more time, I would show you. This is a work in progress. I've got, uh, you shouldn't have asked this question. I'll just tell you for as a matter of information that I've got some early cloud collision simulations. What happens is that if two, for first, first of all, when two galaxies collide, the chances of, of stars in those galaxies colliding with other stars is essentially zero. It's not absolutely zero, but very, very infrequent, very. They're just too small. But a gas cloud, uh, much larger and more diffuse, and the chances of gas clouds colliding when two galaxies collide is much higher. And when they do, two gas clouds collide, they simply cannot interpenetrate. There are, uh, although they're mostly, <laughs> mostly vacuum, they're not entirely vacuum. And when you actually make some estimates of how far individual molecules in one cloud can travel before they encounter a molecule in another cloud, it turns out to be rather small, a couple of parsecs or, or less. And so a cloud of 30 or 40 parsecs across, meaning another similar size cloud, is just not going to pass through. They are going to collide and they're going to stick to form a single cloud. And the angular momentum, whatever it is, well, it may cause rotation. There may be heating because of the kinetic energy loss. All sorts of interesting things can happen, but they're not going to interpenetrate. No way. Okay, a second uh, one. Can you simulate dark matter interactions? I have. In fact, that, that last simulation that had the two uh, spiral galaxies disk galaxies passing through, they both had dark matter halos. You ask, well, where were they? And my answer, of course, is they're dark. But they're there, actually, S seriously. It's not that difficult to model a dark halo and embed your disk galaxy inside the halo, as long as the halo, the dark matter halo, remains a sphere, a spherically symmetric Dark matter halo is easy to deal with computationally. If you allow the halo to change its shape, for example, if two disk galaxies, each with their own dark matter halo, interact with each other, it, and if dark matter obeys the law of gravity, which it appears to, then it's reasonable to imagine that the interaction not only alters the shapes of the visible stars, but the shapes of the dark halos as well. However, I can't model that, it's too complicated. So uh, during that interaction, which formed the elliptical galaxies, those galaxies were each embedded in a unchanging, large, dark spherical halo, which, which interpenetrated and did its own thing, but was responsible for the fact that very few, if any of the stars that interact were flying off in the space because they were inside a very massive dark halo, which prevented them from flying off. And I think I probably bunged up this. So, so modeling dark halos is very easy, as long as, long as you don't allow them to change shape. <laughs> However, it takes computing cycles. So you slow things down. I would rather not distribute my code. For one thing, I'm not very proud of it. It's a beginner's code. It contains, contains a, I, I know there are better ways of doing things now, and I haven't bothered updating my code. So a lot of the code is kind of crummy. <laughs> and, I, and I'd rather, to be honest with you, this is something that anybody in this room could do. If you just had some time, put your mind to it. No, uh, the Python book is good for discussing the nuts and bolts of Python. It does a little bit of animation, but not nearly enough. But I did find uh, a lot of help, a lot of help on the internet. There's a site called Stack Overflow, especially useful. But if you just Google your problem with Python, you will be surprised 
at the number of possible sites that come up. I found some excellent working examples of n-body code on by just rummaging around on, I think, I, I'm not sure it was Stack Overflow or not, but Python itself, Stack Overflow is kind of independent of Python, is my understanding, but Python itself has its own help. Uh, some of it's obtuse, so you make mistakes, but looking for example, working examples on the internet saved my life, and that really helped. I can't recommend it more. Anyway, I'm sorry, but I <laughs> I would be embarrassed. Yeah. So, are we done? So I'm just borrowing the mic to officially thank Barry for this wonderful talk and his amazing simulations. And you might not be proud of your code, but we're impressed with what you've done. <laughs> and thank you ever so much. It was a jolly good show. You're welcome. Uh, uh, do, I, do you want me to break the uh, sharing? Yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah. 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 Uh, what's up next? Back to your PowerPoint. I'm leaving here. Uh, or, uh, like, uh, or, uh, yes, actually, so I don't know. I'll just get out of the way. You guys know what you're doing. I don't. I just walk up to it. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? All right. Wonderful. Uh, while Dave is uh, switching over from one to the tother, uh, you can see on our screen, Pat Kelly is our next guest up, but I just want to, um, I'll move over so you don't have to move the camera quite so much. A couple of things for those in the room uh, and for those in Zoom land too. We do have copies of the 2023 RASC Observers Calendar. So if anybody wants one in the room, they're 25. For those of you out in Zoom land, if you uh, send an e-transfer to our treasurer at treasurer at halifax.rasc.ca and include in the notes your name and mailing address, uh, we will send you one. Also, we have the Explore the Universe and they're $20, I believe, so they are available. And this is the third edition, it's the most current edition, so please know that they're available. Uh, to that next up is our next speaker, Pat Kelly. Pat, as most of you know, is, has been a member of RASC for numerous years. Uh, he is currently on our board, has been a member of both the, here locally as well as on the National RASC, the National Council, and has served various roles. Uh, he is currently the vice president of our center. And today his presentation is on the sun and the earth, and they're not usual. And so I will leave it to you, Pat, to take it from here. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Judy. I'm going to try sharing the just the keynote file and see if that works. If not, I'll share the desktop. So, so are you seeing the title page? Anyone? Yeah, I can see. Yes. Ah, okay. Very good. Uh, so the reason I, I decided to, to put this talk together is because every now and then I still run across somebody who tends to think that the sun is just one of all the stars in the galaxy and is an average star. Um, and I usually have to start explaining them that, you know, it's not an average star. And I thought, well, what about planets? Is the Earth an average planet? And I thought, no, not really. <laughs> So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to show that these two topics are, are sort of related in the sense that the sun not being an average star and the earth not being an average planet. And I'm going to sort of tie it into the search for other planets, which inevitably leads to the search for life on other planets. So back in the early 1800s, or early 1800s, into the late 1800s and in the early 1900s, uh, as technology developed, astronomers were able to look at a whole bunch of stars and derive a whole bunch of properties of them, including their temperature. So you can actually figure out what the surface temperature of a star is. 
And by knowing how bright it appears to be in the sky, it's so-called apparent luminosity, and by using methods like parallax to figure out exactly how far away the star actually is, you can compute its absolute luminosity. So if you've got a whole bunch of stars for which you have the temperature and the luminosity, what do you think scientists are going to do with that data? They're going to try plotting them. And the first two people who actually did this, uh, one did it in Europe, one did it in North America. There was no internet back then, uh, but Egnar Hertzsprung, who was in Denmark, and Henry Norris Russell, who's in the United States, a few years apart, independently did the same thing. They produced a diagram plotting the temperature of a star on one axis and the luminosity of a star on the other axis. And this diagram is very famous. If you get any first year astronomy textbook, you'll find a whole bunch of it in the section about stars. It's called an Hertzsprung Russell diagram, or just an HR diagram for short. And this is what it looks like. So you'll notice that what they have plotted on here is the surface temperature. And this is one of those things that's not intuitive to most people. Uh, the surface temperature increases as you go to the left. I don't know why they did that, but in most cases, when you're plotting numbers on the x-axis, it increases going to the right. Uh, they both chose to do it this way with the surface temperature increasing going to the left. And the color of the star also changes as the surface temperature changes. So you have red stars that are only red hot, as they get hotter at the surface, they tend to take on a more of an orange color, then a yellowish color, then a white color, uh, and then eventually they become sort of blue hot, very, very hot. And you can also see on this diagram, they plotted the luminosity in a measurement called solar luminosities. So the sun is plotted on here, right here, and it has a luminosity of, by definition, one solar luminosity. And in this axis, it's a logarithmic scale. So every time you go up one tick mark here, you change it by a factor of 100. So a star that is up here is 100 times as luminous as the sun. A star up here is 10,000. A star up here is a million times brighter than the sun is. And similarly down here, a star down here is 1 100th one as bright. And a star down here is 1 10,000th as bright. Now, you'll notice that the stars tend to fall into a bunch of areas on here, there's areas where there's very few stars plotted. And there's this red line down here, we're gonna talk about a little bit called the main sequence, which is where stars spend most of their time. But from the point of view of looking for extraterrestrial life, there are parts of this diagram or stars and parts of this diagram that you can basically rule out. These stars down here are dead. Any planet that was around them that had life on it is dead as well. These ones up here are in the process of dying. They're getting really, really large and engulfing any planets near them. And these ones up here are also dying. So the places where you're likely to find life are the stars that are left on this line called the main sequence that runs diagonally down through the HR diagram. And I think part of the reason why people sometimes get this idea that the sun is an average star is because if you look on this diagram, the sun is more or less right in the middle of it. And in most cases, if you're plotting a whole bunch of data and it sort of forms a bit of a pattern and the sun is, and something is in the middle of that pattern, you would think that that's sort of an average thing for. So I think this is why people sometimes still get this idea that the sun is average, because if you look at it on the main sequence, it's right in the middle. It's about halfway in from both ends of it. And what you do find is if, if you start at the lower right hand edge of this main sequence and you work your way up towards the upper left, you notice that you're moving to the left. So the temperature increases as you go up along the main sequence. You're moving up, so the luminosity increases. And it turns out, I've got another version of it here, the size of the star also increases. So this is sort of a schematic diagram that shows the main sequence again is a red line. This line along here, any star that's on this line has one solar radius. It's the same size as the sun. And you can see that by definition, the sun has to be on that line. So there's the sun. Stars down here are one tenth the size of the sun. Down here are one one hundredth the size of the sun. And you can see these areas where the stars are dying and also dying. These stars have gotten very, very big. A hundred times the size of the sun, a thousand times the size of the sun. So these stars have gotten very, very large. And 
if they didn't have any planets near them, they're long since gone. So why do you end up with stars for, on this main sequence? What's the main thing that determines this fact that as you move up along here, the temperature increases, the luminosity increases, and the size increases? Turns out that the one property of a star that you need to know to figure out exactly where it ends up on the main sequence is its mass. So it's entirely derived by the mass of the star when it was formed. And this again is a highly schematic diagram of the main sequence. Um, so you can see again, here we have the solar luminosity. So this is one solar luminosity. So that's why the sun is where it is. And this is the masses of stars in solar masses. And you can see this is the, the sun has one solar mass. A star up here on the main sequence has twice the mass of the sun. Up here, it has almost six times the mass of the sun. And way up here at this very end, you get stars that have 60 times the mass of the sun. And ones down here that are less luminous than the sun and smaller as well are small fractions. Down here, you're down to about 21%, or about one fifth the mass of the sun. So when a star is formed, it ends up on the main sequence. And it spends most of its life on the main sequence because it has reached a point where it's in balance. The fusion of hydrogen and helium at the core producing energy pushing out is balanced by the gravitational attraction of all the mass trying to compress the star. So it sort of sits there and it just sort of does what does its thing. And a star will typically spend about 80% of its life just sitting there on the main sequence and just very, very slowly moving around a little bit on the HI diagram, but more or less staying in place. Now, the reason the mass of stars end up at that upper end of the main sequence is because all that extra gravity caused by all that extra mass produces so much pressure on the center of the star that the rate at which hydrogen gets turned into helium to produce the energy to push out also has to go up by a huge amount. And what that means, oddly enough, is we've got areas where stars are dead and dying and also dying. Because these stars up here, even though they start off with, in this case, say 60 times as much mass as the sun, they're going to go through it in a couple of million years. So all the stars up on this end of the main sequence are about to start dying. So they have very short lifetimes, uh, not nearly long enough to produce intelligent life or life in general, as we tend to think of it. Now, stars aren't formed singly. They're actually formed in clusters. And this is a, an animation showing uh, a gas cloud that's going to condense down to form stars. Uh, this was not done on a laptop. This was done on, a, on a, a supercomputer some years ago. And you can see right now the size is about 82,500 astronomical units, as is up here. So this gas cloud is sort of condensed down. And what you'll actually see is as the gas gets denser, as you're looking through it from this direction, the colors are going to change. So I'm just going to start it. And again, this is, just, it's kind of funny that, uh, that Gary's talk was about the same thing. They're doing essentially the same thing um, where they're looking at small pockets of gas and just simply letting gravity move them and using a large computer to do the simulations. Um, so they're going to just change the scale here because it's getting really dense in parts of this. And if you look in the upper right hand corner, you'll see that this is about 200,000 years in. And as the gas condenses out, it will produce stars. And you see there's all sorts of weird things happening in here. And generally, you can tell where most of the mass is because the more mass there is, the faster things happen. That's usually a general rule of anything to do with astronomy. If things are happening really fast, there's usually a lot of mass involved in it.
So you get a whole bunch of stars. There's still some leftover gas and, and some left out, leftover dust in there as well. And what you end up with this in real life rather than a simulation is when you get something like this. So you have a whole bunch of newly created stars in a star cluster and still some more of the gas that's still around from the actual formation. And eventually what happens is the radiation pressure from all these really, really hot stars blows the remaining gas and dust away and you're just left with an open star cluster. Now, the one thing to keep in mind is that HR diagram that shows the main sequence is missing one key thing when it comes to the stars along the main sequence. And that is, again, something that Gary sort of alluded to in his talk, how many stars do you get at different spots along that main sequence? Now, most people in life, or most people that have taken any, any sort of, uh, uh, even high school math, is probably familiar with something called a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution. This is actually the first image that came up when I, when I um, Googled Gaussian distribution image. So I just stuck with it. So this is basically a distribution that a lot of things that are natural tend to fall under, where you tend to have, uh, this is the density or the probability of finding things with this particular value. And there's a peak in the middle. So about half of the objects that you're talking about are on this side of the peak, half are on this side of the peak. So in this case, case this is the height of 14 year old girls. And I'm guessing that this is 1.5 meters. So 1.5, oh yeah, it is in meters. Uh, I didn't correct it to non-US and switch the E and the R around. So from this point on, about half of the girls when they're age 14 are going to be higher than 1.5 meters and half are going to be left. And there's only two numbers that you need to actually describe this type of distribution. There's the mean, which is the place where it, the peak occurs. And there's this thing called the standard deviation, which is sort of how flat it is. So here's three different Gaussian distributions, the red ones and the blue ones have the same standard deviation. They have the same amount of spread, but the means are different. And the red and the green one have the same mean. In other words, the point where the 50-50 occurs is the same spot here at zero. But in the case of the green one, you're, going, you're more likely to find things further and further away. So that's a standard type of distribution. And a lot of people are familiar with this. And a lot of things fall into this. If you measure, for example, the diameter of ball bearings coming off of an assembly line. They follow a distribution like this. So naturally one tends to think, if you're looking at this main sequence, um, how are they distributed? Well, it turns out it's not using a Gaussian distribution. There's another type of distribution called the Pareto distribution, which also has one or two numbers that describe it. And basically an easy way to think of this Pareto distribution is by thinking of it as a success breeds success distribution. You can either do it this way as a curve, or if you're looking at things, you can sort of count things up and produce a bar chart like this. And this shows up in all sorts of other places. For example, it shows up in the NHL. If you take the total number of goals scored by the top scores in the NHL and plot them, so these are your zero to 10 or one to 10. These are your top 10 scores. They've collectively scored this many goals. The next 10 players added together have scored this many goals. The next 10 players have scored this many goals. And you get out down here where you get lots and lots and lots of players with very few goals. So goals scored in a lot of things, it's such as in, in, the, in the National Hockey League or most other sports, they're not distributed using a normal distribution. Uh, book sales are the same way. The top 10 authors make most of the money. Um, same thing with music sales. As somebody once uh, quipped about the Pareto distribution when it comes to music, is with the advent of computers, it meant that anybody could make music. And the net result was that most people don't want to listen to your music. They want to listen to the music from a very small number of people. And it turns out, that when you actually look at the distribution for stars, the same sort of thing happens. You end up with a distribution where almost all of the mass goes into producing a small number of very massive stars. So when you go back to the HR diagram, even though the sun looks like it's in the middle here, 
Most of the mass is used up in a very small number here. And as you go further and further down, there's more and more and more stars that get less and less mass, just like these scores in the NHL. And by the time you get down here, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of stars, and they're all very, very, very small mass. So as it turns out, when you actually look at it from, a, from that point of view, here's all the stars on the main sequence. And the dividing line, so you start here at 12 o'clock, the stars down to here, everything in this wedge is more luminous than the sun. From here to here, this is one to two solar masses. So the sun is right here. All of these stars here, 88% of the stars in this diagram have a mass smaller than the mass of the sun. And therefore the sun is not by any stretch of imagination an average star. In fact, you can see that almost 40% of the stars have masses less than a quarter of the sun's mass. They're very, very dim, very, very small, and very, very cool at their surfaces. So what does this have to do with exoplanets? Well, up until 30 years ago, uh, there really weren't a lot of exoplanets around. Um, we've been overwhelmed with them recently. Uh, depending on who you talk to, there's between five and 7,000 that have been confirmed. Uh, and it turns out, if you want to track this yourself, there's a, a, a neat little app called Exoplanet, which has a database of all of the confirmed exoplanets. And it updated itself uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, uh, just zooming on that. And you see that the number that are confirmed right now, they finally broke 5,000. And the reason why this says selected 5,049 is because in the database, I've turned on the eight planets in our solar system plus Pluto. So that's why there's actually uh, nine more there. So now you've got huge numbers of extrasolar planets and you can get lots of information about them. So the question is, how can you lump them? How can you sort of look at them? Well, NASA uh, splits them into four main types. The first main type are gas giants. And we have two examples of gas giants in our own solar system, uh, Saturn and Jupiter. Um, and it's probably not a big surprise to discover that they're sort of defined as a giant planet composed mostly of gas. Uh, in a way though, we've really been sort of short shifted in our solar system uh, by having Jupiter as the largest of the gas giants because I was sort of curious, uh, when you start poking around in that database, you can actually sort all 5,000 by mass and see what's the most massive planet that's been discovered so far. Well, if you go back to this diagram, so here's the mass diagram for an HR diagram. And you'll notice that at some point down here, the main sequence actually stops. And the reason for that is that if you don't have enough mass, you cannot get the temperature and the pressure inside the core of the star hot enough to actually start the hydrogen to helium fusion process. What you get is just a really, really big gas planet. And you can sort of work out theoretically where that cutoff is. And it turns out it's about 8% of the sun's mass. And it turns out that's actually a really easy number to remember. So if you take the 0 0.08 solar masses and say, well, What's that in Jupiter masses? Just flip them around, it's 80. So you can get up to about 80 times the mass of Jupiter, and then it starts becoming a very, very dim star. And the largest exoplanet that's been found is 57 solar or 57 Jupiter masses. And how cool it would be to have one of these whiffing around inside our solar system somewhere. We won't know, but uh, and we probably don't want to know. At least you don't want to add one now, but it would be neat to see sort of something a little bit bigger than Jupiter, what they're actually like up close. So that's one category. The next category are, are referred to as Neptune-like. So they, they use the term gaseous. Uh, I would use the term gaseous slash icy uh, worlds around the size of Neptune. Uh, 
And clearly, if you're looking at Neptune-like planets, Neptune is one of them, as is Uranus. So we actually have two of these inside our solar system, which is kind of nice. The one class that we're missing are what are called super-Earths. So these are rocky worlds, but usually uh, considerably larger than the Earth. So generally, most people sort of take the cutoff as being two to four times the mass of the Earth. Um, and we don't have one like this. It'd be nice to see one of these that close, uh, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. And then we have the terrestrial ones, which is a rocky world, sort of about the size of the Earth or smaller, uh, that's clearly not in our own solar system. And we have 5,000 of these things now to play around with. So you can actually take a look and see how they're distributed. And it turns out um, the ones that are like the Earth are actually only about 4% of the total. So you'll notice that, for example, gas giants, about 30%. Super Earths are about 30%. And Neptune-like are about 30%. But Earth-like planets are a very, very small number of them. So if we're looking for life as we know it, we can sort of rule out generally the gas giants and we can rule out the Neptune-like ones over here. We're sort of stuck to these ones in the middle the Earth-like and the super-Earths. And you can, again, you can think of this as sort of a Pareto distribution because if you've got about 1,500 Jupiter things and 1,500 Neptune things, these things, remember, are much, much more massive than these. So the total mass involved in these is just like on the main sequence. Most of the mass goes into producing these objects, a lot less mass is left over to produce these, although in this case, the numbers are more or less comparable, and even less mass is left over to produce the super Earths and the regular Earths. So where are all the missing terrestrial planets? Well, the biggest problem with terrestrial planets is that they're small. And you don't have to strain your eyes or tip your head sideways to see this. Uh, this is a diagram that shows the first 178 known exoplanets. The only thing you really have to know about this diagram is this is the size of the orbit in astronomical units. The Earth is at one astronomical unit here. Uh, Mars is about one and a half, and Jupiter is out about here. And the other thing is that you'll notice that most of these, in fact, about half of them, are actually have orbits that are smaller than the Earth's orbit. And without exception, every single thing on this list has a map, has a mass that's a multiple of Jupiter's mass. So these are gas giant planets or Neptune-like planets in really, really close to their stars. And, it, and when this was first discovered, it was thought, well, first of all, we are the terrestrial planets and how'd they get in there like that? So close to the stars. Uh, they worked out ways you can get Jovian planets in near the sun uh, or in near their stars. But the main thing is that big things are easy to find because the methods that were used to find these things, the more mass you have, the more obvious that the signal is that you're looking for, and therefore the easier they are to actually come up with. So originally when people first started looking at these things, it was the mass uh, that was the problem. The other problem that you tend to have with these planets when you're actually taking, looking at them is that if you're looking for life on a planet, you want to have a planet that is inside that star's habitable zone. Now, in the case of the solar system, where we have the sun, uh, this is the orbit of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And the habitable zone is basically defined as an area where you would expect to be able to find liquid water on the surface of the planet. And the reason it's, we're looking for liquid water is because we're looking for life as we know it and life as we understand it requires liquid. In fact, one of my favorite descriptions of humans from Star Trek The Next Generation was a crystalline life form that referred to us as ugly bags of mostly water, which very aptly describes humans. And you need chemistry to actually have that, to have life as we understand it. And that chemistry has to be generally carbon compounds dissolved in liquid, water's everywhere. So you're basically looking for water. Venus, 
bit too hot. Mars, a bit too small, a bit too cold, Mercury in too hot. And there was a lot of excitement back when the Kepler spacecraft discovered a planet called Kepler 22b. So the star is Kepler 22. Uh, they decided that the first planet discovered would be 22b, not 22a. I'm not quite sure why, but that's the way they did it. Uh, and this planet was actually thought to be inside that star's habitable zone. Now, the reason these habitable zones are sort of um, as broad as they are is because to get the temperature right, you can fiddle that by having things such as greenhouse gases in your atmosphere. So here's the atmosphere composition of the terrestrial planets, uh, the ones that actually have an atmosphere. So this is leaving out the moon, leaving out Mercury. But you'll notice, for example, that in the case of Venus, its atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide. In the case of Mars, it's almost entirely carbon dioxide. And in the case of Earth, it's mostly nitrogen and oxygen. If you look at the actual amount of atmosphere that these planets have, this is mentioned in bars, uh, which means that Earth is one. Uh, Mars is very, very thin. It's only about 1% of Earth's um, atmosphere. And Venus has about 92 times as much as the Earth's atmosphere. But they're very different planets in terms of their average temperatures. And part of the reason for that is because of that greenhouse gas, which is carbon dioxide. If you look, for example, at Mars, even though it has a very small atmosphere uh, and it's well away from the sun, the average surface temperature on Mars is about five degrees hotter than it would be without any greenhouse gases. In the case of Venus, it's about 400 degrees hotter everywhere on the planet than it would be if it didn't have greenhouse gases. And if I ask most people to sort of guess, well, we know that Earth has some greenhouse gases, a very small amount of carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor. And we know that putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a bit of a problem. And I've often heard people say, well, yeah, but it, it's not that big of a change. Um, until you actually work out, and it's a fairly simple calculation to do, how much warmer is the Earth because of the small amount of greenhouse gas it already has, it's 35 degrees. So if the Earth had no greenhouse gases at all, the average temperature everywhere on this planet would be about 35 degrees colder than it is right now. And for those of us who enjoy this lovely last day of really cold weather in Nova Scotia, I don't think you want to try that with an extra 35 degrees subtracted from those temperatures anytime soon. So depending on where your greenhouse gases are, you've got some, some wiggle room in terms of that. And of course, if you take all of Earth's carbon dioxide out of fossil fuels and limestone and dissolved in the oceans and put it all back in the atmosphere, then you discover that in fact, Venus and Earth and Mars are almost identical in terms of their atmospheric compositions. The Earth would just have a bit more atmosphere than Jupiter or that Venus and the temperature would be considerably more than 35 degrees warmer than it is right now. Now, one of the big things that a lot of people were also excited about was when they discovered the TRAPPIST-1 system. And the TRAPPIST-1 system has, you can count them, seven planets, rocky planets in the habitable zone. The one problem though, is that as you look at stars that have less and less and less and less mass, because those stars are very, very small and very, very dim, the habitable zone around them is really, really close to the star itself. So here's our solar system down here, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And we have a bunch of data on all of these planets and the Earth is used as sort of a reference. So for example, the distance from the star is one astronomical unit. The radius of the planet is one Earth radius for the Earth. The mass is one Earth mass for the Earth. The density is one unit for Earth in terms of kilograms per cubic meter. And the surface gravity is one. So if you look at most of these other planets here, you can see that one Earth mass, 1.16 Earth masses. So they're all more or less in the terrestrial category. But look at the orbital periods. 
This one goes around its star in one and a half days. And the problem with all of these planets is they are so close to the star that they are tidally locked and they keep one side permanently facing the star. And we've seen this in the solar system, the moons of Jupiter do it, the earth moon system, the moon keeps one side facing the earth. And if you're trying to look for liquid water on a, on a planet where half of it is always facing the sun and the other half is always not facing the sun, that's gonna be extremely unlikely. So one of the problems with looking for stars along that lower end of the main sequence is that generally in order to get in where the habitable zone is, any planets in there are gonna be tidally locked to their stars, which again is a problem. Okay. So if you're looking for water, what about looking for water in our solar system? Because we know there's water on Earth, we know there's life on Earth. So one of the things that you can actually work out fairly easily is, are there other places in the solar system where there could be liquid water and where life might actually have evolved? It may be that if we're looking for life, maybe we're going about it the wrong way. Maybe we should start looking a little bit closer to home. And it turns out that if you have a planet that has large moons and the moons are in nice circular orbits, such as the moons around Jupiter or the moons around Saturn, um, Jupiter would like each of those moons to keep one side facing it and in a nice perfectly circular orbit. The problem is, is that as the moons go around, they're tugged gravitationally by the other large moons, which pulls them a little bit out from Jupiter and then they're going a little bit closer to Jupiter. And as the planet, or as the moon gets a little bit closer, a little bit further out, the tidal stresses on that moon will cause it to flex. Now, I did an entire talk about this. Uh, so for those of you who are not restricted by the temporal prime directive, uh, go back to the 2017 Dark Sky Weekend down in Kujik, Kujik National Park, and you can see a longer version of this. The short version is nothing on here is to scale. Everything on here is hideously represented, misrepresented. But the key thing to note is that as Io, for example, the closest moon, gets pulled out by Europa and then comes back in again, it's tidally flexed and nowhere near this extent. This is again, greatly exaggerated. But that flexing heats up the actual interior of the moon. And that's why Io is covered with volcanoes. It's a very small object that normally would have long since cooled off like the moon and be geologically inactive, but it has this extra source of energy. And if you have objects in the outer solar system that are made up mostly out of water, that water can be kept liquid by this gravitational effect. And this is a diagram that sort of shows the Earth, Europa, uh, which is one of Jupiter's moons, and Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, uh, how much water they have if you could put it all into one ball. And you notice that Earth, although we think of Earth as being covered with water, the oceans on Earth are actually very, very thin. The oceans that are under the surfaces of these objects are very, very deep, and they actually have more water on them than the Earth does. And if you sort of work it out, where we take the Earth as having one unit of water, Europa has twice as much water as the Earth does. Callisto has almost five. Ganymede may have up to 27 times as much water as the Earth. Titan has about up to 14. And even little tiny Enceladus has about 1% of the Earth's oceans. So it may very well be that if we're looking for life, we may be able to find it in our own solar system if we just simply go for looking for where the water is. And it's now thought by a lot of people that life on Earth probably started down in the hot vents where there's active geology under the actual ocean surface. How do we find out? Well, it turns out you just have to wait because still on track to be launched in October of 2024 is the Europa Clipper mission, uh, which is a NASA mission, which is going to get very, very close to Europa in, on a number of passes. And we might actually get a better idea of just how much water is there. It's due to arrive in April of 2030. So set that on your calendars for seven years from now. I'm always underwhelmed by the current state of space technology on Earth, but 
you have to go with what you've got. So hopefully in uh, another seven years, eight years, we might have a much better idea of just how much water there is in Europa. And maybe that's the place where we start to be looking for life. So I, I will try to answer any questions anybody has. And I think I will see if I can stop sharing my screen now rather than frantically trying to figure out how to do it later. Ah, there we go. Are there any questions in the room? Are there any questions on the Zoom? No, I have one. Um, my question is, or I guess more of a comment is here, distribution of the different four different planet types or classifications. I think the uh, terrestrial planets are greatly undersampled because of just the, uh, the observational difficulty it is to discover them. Because yes, the that, that's the problem. The smaller yeah. they are, the harder they are to see. Yeah, and the ones, of course, that are in close to their parent star are also easy to discover because the transit, for example, or the gravitational effects of the tugging are much easier to detect than the ones who, that are out around Jupiter when you got to wait 12 years for uh, you know for them to uh, have an effect. So yeah, and it, I mean if you if you put say 20 blue whales in Bedford Basin and 20 goldfish, I bet you'd find blue whales before you'd find goldfish. <laughs> and that's the problem is that the is that the methods um, the radial velocity method again. I did a talk on this a while back, but basically the first method that was used was the radial velocity method. And the more mass you have there, the closer in it is, it shows up really, really, it's really easy to find. And the same thing is true with the modern, the method that's usually used now, which is transits, that the, the bigger the, the object is compared to the actual star, the more obvious the dip in brightness and therefore the easier it is to find them. But I got a kick out of some of them because one of the ones is something like in the 20 solar mass or 20 Jupiter mass range, it has an orbital period of like 3 million years. And that's partly because of the fact that the, uh, the smaller stars have a much smaller amount of gravitational pull and therefore everything happens more slowly. So in our solar system, if you increase the mass of the Earth, the planets would start going around it faster or increase the mass of the sun, the planets would start going around it faster and faster. And if you decreased it, they would go around slower and slower. And then if you get a really large object that's fairly far out, uh, it'd be no problem at all to have a, an object that takes millions of years to make one orbit. Any questions on the Zoom? Would there be any possibility with those tidally locked planets of there being any kind of twilight zone in between uh, completely sunlit and completely dark? Well, that that would that would definitely work, um, but it's probably gonna, it's probably going to be a very thin strip. Mm. So you would, you would have to be sort of on the right one. In fact, I've actually, I, I've, I've read uh, uh, stories where there have been planets like that, uh, except the problem is it's usually very windy along there because the hot air, the air tends to circulate from the hot side around to the cold side. Um, so it's it, it's rather challenging to be there. But the, the, the big problem is that you're, you're, you're restricted to a very, very small area. Um, but that would probably, it's, it's, let me put it this way, it's better than nothing. <laughs> yeah, I think I was remembering a Hugo Award story from about 1971. Might have been the same one I was that I that I had read. Uh, oh, but, but yeah, that's one of the one of the big problems is when you're trying to deal with uh, a, a, that small of an area. It's like, well, uh, you might be able to do it if you had an atmosphere that where it was really hot and really cold, and obviously it's got a transition from them. Um, but you're really making yourself life really hard for yourself. <laughs> okay. I have uh, one question for Patrick. Yeah. So great talk, by the way. Thanks. Thanks for that. But um, so looking at the Trappist system, you show, I think it was seven or eight uh, terrestrial planets. 
um, which seems to be at odds with the design of our own solar system. So, so is this a, a, a type? Do, do we know of a, of a way that you could have only terrestrial planets in a, in a system? Or do you think there's just undiscovered gas giants looking around out there? There, that... there might be. What, one of the big problems, uh, or one of the other issues, uh, which does let you find in these rocky ones, is that you're basically looking in the... Grab this. If, if you're looking at the plane of, of the solar system, for the transit thing to work, you basically have to be looking edge on to the star so that the planets come in front, block the light and go down again. Now, if that's tipped a little bit, a planet that's in really close will still be able to block light from the sun, but a bigger one further out will go over the planet and under the planet. So there could be other planets further out, um, but you may not see them. And then as Davis pointed out, the other problem you have is that the further out you go, the longer it takes. So if we were to do this method, for example, with the Jupiter, you know, with the sun, um, Jupiter has an orbital period of what, about 10 years. So you'd only get a, you'd, you'd get one blip and then you'd have to wait 10 more years to get a second blip to confirm that the first blip <laughs> wasn't just a big sunspot or some other odd thing. So how long have we been studying that Trappist system? I think it only was discovered on about a year, okay. a year or two ago. So it, it's, uh, it, that, and that's one of the problems is that it, when they're really close, you get, you know, if you've got a plant that's going around every five days, <laughs> it does take long to see blip, 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 blip. It's like, yeah, there's obviously a planet there. And that's why the Jupiter ones were found really early on uh, because the fact that using the radial velocity method, they were in really close. So you're watching a star's radial velocity shift as the, Star was tugged towards you and away, towards you and away. When that's being done three or four, every three or four weeks, you can pick up the signal. And again, in our system, if you're using that method, you'd have to wait 10 years right. to go through one whole cycle of it. Thank you. Right. Welcome. Any further questions? None from Zoomland. Any further questions from the room? Um, quick question about the, 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 the moons in our solar system that have liquid water. Uh, I remember seeing, I think it's Enceladus that has a very, very, like several kilometer thick ice layer that covers up all the liquid water. And Titan, I think the temperatures are rather really, I think are really cold on the surface. Out of all the out of all the uh, moons that have liquid water that you were you brought up in that slide, which one is the most feasible to like land a craft on and get a sample back to Earth from? Ooh. Well, one of the problems with Jupiter, um, in fact, one of the problems with the Europa Clipper mission in the first place is that Jupiter has very strong um, magnetic and particle fields in near the planet. Uh, and that's that's why they're actually just flying past it really, really close. If you lead a spacecraft in too close for too long, you start running into problems with the uh, reliability of the of the hardware. The further out you go, the less that's a problem. Then the longer it takes you to get out, and the longer it takes you to get something back. And the question is, how much ice do you actually want to go go down through? I would still say probably Enceladus, just because if it is only a couple of kilometers of ice, that might actually be doable. And I think there were some people, um, there was a lake that was discovered more by accident by the, uh, the Russians some years ago, called, I think it's called Lake Vostok. Uh, they were doing ground penetrating thing by dragging something over the ice in Antarctica and just measuring the reflection down to map out the, under, uh, the underground terrain. And they kept making passes across it that was perfectly flat and realized that there's actually a lake, a, a very large lake underneath the ice there. And if you're actually going to try and do this on another moon, that's where I would try first to see if you can actually do it here on Earth, where your tech support is in the tent next to the hole that you're somehow making down there and not dozens of astronomical units away. Definitely good to have a first trial. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Pat, for this. Uh, it's been uh, enlightening, uh, I, I guess, and uh, a little frightening to think that we are alone out here in the galaxy. Uh, but uh, that may be a good thing. Who knows? <laughs> Not more like us. 
Uh, so thank you very much. Next up on our agenda is Paul Heath. Uh, as many of you are aware, uh, this past week, Terence Dickinson uh, passed away. It's been a long time RASP member. Uh, he was the founding editor of Sky News and several other uh, editions of books and children's <laughs> stories and whatnot. And when Paul found out about Terence's death or Terry's death, he wrote this poem. And so I will have now have Paul come up and share it with us, please. Hey. Yeah. Uh, like many of us, we've been uh, mentored by Terence's books and by different uh, lectures that he's been at, uh, different events that he's participated with that we've had the luck and uh, to to be with him. Uh, personally, I had a, a, a nice connection with him in, in regards when I first got started. His book, Night Watch, uh, encourages you to copy his star maps in order to find the Mezzi objects. And when I went to do that at Staples, they refused because of copyright regulations. So I emailed them and said, well, they won't let me do this. And he sent me a letter with his signature that I could match to the signature in, it, in the book that he signed for me. <laughs> and uh, then they photocopied and laminated his, his charts that he, in the book, states everyone should do. So uh, he's, he was a very generous uh, individual. And uh, his talks at Nova East and uh, a couple other events that I've been at with him were, were memorable. So what, um, and I also read the obituary uh, that his wife had written and a lot of the comments are online there the first evening that we we uh, found out the news. So that uh, this is where, what inspired me for, for this poem. And I hope it, uh, it pays tribute to Terrence. Okay, this is in my, there. can you still hear me? Last page has turned, Ode to Terence Dickinson. The last page has been turned, another story is closed. Yet somehow his story grows and grows, each page that's turned, each page he penned. His story lingers with the memory of his words. The last page is turned, but the next, a blank page, a canvas unwritten on, yet full of wonder, wonder left for all with enthusiasm and joy, with joy of discovery still to be made. The last page has turned, yet his quiet, generous voice still speaks. His words and tomes we hold cherish in our hands, our first encouragement so many found, to seek the darkened sky's treasured gems expounded on by his descriptive pen. His last page has turned. The accolades upon the wall, a small measure of his heart's directed pen. A voice he gave us, its legacy we must not let fall. For enlightenment was his skill of wonders we have sought in darkened skies. His last page is turned. Yet within our glistening teardrops, Memories of chasing the sun's hidden glorious soul and learned talks upon glass-filled open fields and meetings that made us rush to his tomes to plan our journeys into darkened skies. His last page is turned, yet no longer tethered to the earth does he journey now to his namesake island in the sky, perhaps to linger one turn about our star until his journey stretches out so far, he will touch the wonders within the darkened sky that his heart has led many to aspire. His last page is left for us all to fill with wonder and enthusiasm and delight for us to pin the joy of a dark and glittering starlit night. I hope it uh, pay some tribute to Ter Terrence because he was a very generous and kind individual and very learned. Oh, thank you. 
thanks for that, Paul. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll take a few minutes if members here in the room or those out in Zoom land would like to give a brief remembrance of Terry and their encounters with his dear soul. Uh, we will certainly take that time now. No one out in the room? Okay. Um, next up on our agenda, I believe, is David Hoskin. And is what's up in the February sky? So, David, if you're still out there in the ether world, um, please come forward and, and tell us what's up that we can see. Assuming okay, no, we don't have uh, solid skies. Okay, uh, I'm still here, so sharing screen. Okay, um, can everyone hear me? Yes. I seem good. Okay. <clears throat> but, um, actually, before I start, uh, I have a couple announcements uh, from the point of view of uh, outreach. Um, one of our members, Jeff Donaldson, um, has been asked to uh, lead a, a stargazing session at uh, Carol's Corner on February 25th, uh, weather permitting. And uh, Jeff would uh, welcome. Um, help uh, by anyone that wants to go out there with him, uh, preferably with a telescope. So if you're able to go contact Jeff directly or, or um, you can contact me and I'll pass the, uh, pass the message on. Um, the other thing is a little farther in the future, but the uh, Discovery Center has asked uh, uh, Rask Halifax to uh, participate in their um, astronomy day which will be on April 29th. Uh, so uh, we'd love to have uh, some uh, uh, people join uh, uh, myself and, and uh, Peter Hurley um, at, the, at the help out at the booth. And uh, we're hoping, weather permitting, to have some sort of uh, viewing session uh, associated with it, uh, perhaps uh, later in the afternoon. Um, so again, if anyone can, you know, it's a way in, way in the future, but think about it and uh, let myself or, or Peter know if you're if you're interested. Okay, so what's up in February's night sky? Um, you'll remember one of the challenges uh, from last uh, month was uh, Kemble's Cascade. Uh, so here's a, a picture of Kemble's Cascade. Hopefully some of you were able to, to find it with uh, binoculars or a telescope. So the sun uh, is uh, with us longer these days, uh, even though uh, the cloudy rainy skies uh, hid it from us a lot of the time. Um, so sunset is uh, getting later. Uh, at the start of the month, it was at 522. By the end of the month, it'll be at 6 p.m. And uh, dawn is uh, uh, also uh, sunrise is, is uh, also also changing. It's uh, getting earlier in the morning, so the days are getting longer. Uh, by the end of the month, we'll have uh, nearly twelve hours of uh, of sunlight. Um, not. Too much happening on the sun today. Um, this is, I took this uh, image captured, uh, took a screen capture from uh, spaceweather.com this morning. And you can see a few small sunspots, um, but be patient. Uh, apparently there's two large sunspots uh, on the other side of the sun, which uh, will be transiting and, and facing us uh, in about a week's time. Uh, so we may, may be, uh, able to see some more um, uh, exciting solar activity. And speaking of solar activity, <clears throat> this is where we are in terms of sunspot counts. Um, and you can see that uh, we're far um, in advance of the official forecast. Um, so we're already um, at the sun level of sunspot activity that we had 
uh, in at the la the peak of the last uh, solar maximum, um, which was solar cycle 24. So solar cycle 25 is looking to uh, be be quite good. Um, you know, we're still um, a couple of years from the maximum of solar cycle 25. So it's a it's a good time to get your solar filters and your solar telescopes uh, dusted off. Um, the moon this month, um, it, uh, <clears throat> if you um, braved the cold last night uh, and had clear skies, it was near Pollux. Um, the uh, full moon, the snow blinding moon uh, is uh, February 5th, so tomorrow. Uh, last quarter will be the 13th. And then the new moon, the maple sugar moon is on uh, February 20th. Um, a few interesting things to, to look for here. On the 22nd, the moon will be near Jupiter and Venus. On uh, February 26th, it'll be near uh, the Pleiades. Uh, first quarter of the maple sugar moons, February 27th. And if you're uh, uh, a very early riser or up very late, um, in the early morning hours of uh, February 28th, the moon will be uh, near Mars. And, that should look quite nice. Um, so um, a photo opportunity for people um, on the evening of the 26th. Um, this is uh, not to, to scale the moon's uh, a couple, uh, enlarged two times, but you can see where the moon is. It, it's laying ni lying nicely between Aldebaran and the Hyades and the Pleiades uh, off to the other side. And uh, if you have a crop, uh, uh, sensor DSLR, um, a lens in uh, focal length between 100 and 135 millimeters, uh, at least according to Stellarium, um, should frame that uh, quite nicely. Um, those of you doing uh, the uh, Explore the Universe, looking at uh, features on the moon uh, that are part of that program, uh, the best uh, times to look will be at the time of first quarter, February 13th, and last quarter, uh, if you're um, up very late, uh, that's when the uh, uh, Terminator will bisect the moon and, and you'll, uh, on the 13th, uh, you'll be able to see lots of uh, features in, in this area, uh, outlined nicely and contrasting with shadows. And, uh, on the 27th, um, you'll see uh, last quarter. So you'll be able to see uh, all things over here. Planets in February, um, Mercury is still visible, but it's very low in the uh, Eastern horizon and uh, it won't be too long before it uh, fades into morning twilight. Um, you probably notice Venus is quite prominent uh, in the early evening sky. And on the 15th, there'll be a close conjunction with Neptune. Um, on the 22nd, uh, Venus is close to Jupiter and the uh, waxing crescent moon. Mars is still uh, quite obvious in the night sky. It, it's uh, still in Taurus and it's visible for most of the night although its brightness will gradually fade through, uh, through a month as uh, its distance from the Earth uh, increases. Uh, Jupiter, um, we're soon going to lose Jupiter. It's visible in the early evening sky, um, in the area of, of the constellations Pisces and Cetus. Um, and on the 22nd, it's close to the uh, crescent moon and close to Venus on the 28th. Uh, Saturn is no longer uh, visible due to its proximity to the sun. Uranus is high in the early evening sky uh, and uh, Neptune is uh, still visible in the extreme Northeast uh, of, of Aquarius, but uh, it uh, will be fading in the evening twilight as the month progresses. So some uh, things to to look out for and another nice uh, wide field uh, photo opportunity is on the 22nd when uh, Jupiter, uh, crescent moon, the nearly new moon and uh, Venus are um, all in the same area of the sky and, and fairly high up. 
so you have a decent western horizon. That uh, should be a nice, nice image, a nice view. Um, the challenge here is uh, on the 15th of February when uh, Venus and Net Neptune are uh, close together. Um, so this is the view through uh, 15 by 70 binoculars. Um, the challenge is that uh, Venus is very bright. Um, so picking out Neptune in the uh, amidst the brightness of Venus uh, will be a challenge. And on the 28th, um, in 10 by 50 binoculars, this has how close the uh, Mars will appear to, to the moon. Uh, and that uh, should be quite impressive. It, it, it's not going to be a, a, a um, occultation like, like we saw uh, last month, um, if, if you were lucky and didn't have clouds, uh, but it's still uh, going to be a very, a very nice uh, view. Um, Comet uh, C2022E3. Um, so many of us have been taking pictures uh, of that comet. Uh, its current magnitude is uh, about 5.2, but by month's end, it'll fade to 8.1. Uh, it's just uh, had its closest approach to the Earth. Um, it's, uh, you know, one, it's a comet that's moving pretty quickly across the star field. This is the, the motion across the star field in uh, 30 minutes. And uh, this is a picture I took uh, of the comet uh, uh, a couple days ago. Uh, you notice the, the green hue due to the uh, ultraviolet light excitation of diatomic uh, carbon uh, derived from uh, organic compounds on the surface of the, of the comet. Um, we've still got a, probably another a week um, where the comet's going to be pretty bright. Uh, so this is its uh, current track uh, across the sky. Um, so um, if uh, it's clear tonight and uh, you're uh, willing to brave the cold, uh, you can find it uh, uh, just between uh, Canelopardalus and Lynx and just above uh, Capella. So it should be, uh, should be fairly easy to see if you've got dark skies. Uh, we're in, um, we're in uh, February, uh, which is a good time to look for zodiacal light uh, in the Western sky just after twilight. Um, you, you need a, a dark sky and you need a sky where there's no moonlight. Um, but, uh, you know, towards uh, the 19th of February would be a good time, uh, around 7 p.m. Uh, this is zodiac, the zodiacal light uh, as shown in Stellarium. Uh, and uh, well worth uh, looking looking for. It's, it's uh, you know, you can see it quite easily, well, I should say quite easily, but if the skies are dark, it, it's obvious with the, with the unaided eye. And uh, the camera does a, a nice job of picking up zodiacal light as well. For um, going back to explore the universe, winter constellations that uh, you want to uh, identify, uh, Riga, Gemini, Taurus, Orion, Canis Major, and Canis Minor. Uh, all visible uh, in, in the uh, southern sky. Uh, winter stars, um, Sirius is very prominent, the brightest star in, in the night sky, and a number of other bright stars, uh, Capella and Rigel and uh, Procyon. Uh, Procyon, interesting, if you don't know the, the name, but, um, means before the dog because Procyon rises before Sirius, which is the dog star. Uh, winter deep sky objects. Um, so last month, uh, Kemble's Cascade was, was one of the objects. Uh, this month, uh, uh, some open clusters of Pleiades, uh, Messier 45 and uh, Messier 35. And, and the challenge here is uh, find Messier 35, but then see if you can see the small, uh, very compact uh, open cluster, uh, NGC 2158, uh, 
as well in your in your field of view. I don't know if well, maybe in a really dark sky you you might uh, see a, a fuzzy patch with binoculars, but I think you need to you need a telescope to to, to see both. And uh, double stars, um, seventeen. Um, Coma Berenices uh, is a uh, multiple star system that um, should be a, a, a double star that quite easy to see with uh, binoculars. Um, so look in the Coma star cluster, uh, 17 uh, Coma Berenices A is a blue star and 17 Coma Berenices B is a blue white star. They're about an order of magnitude in, in difference in terms of uh, brightness quite widely separated. So good, good binocular targets. Uh, it's a, actually a multiple star system, although it appears to, to our eyes as a binary system because uh, 17 coma Berenices B is actually a, itself a binary system. So there is a 17 coma Berenices C, uh, but uh, we, we can't uh, discern that uh, with uh, our binoculars or amateur telescopes. And uh, that's it uh, for what's up in the February sky. So um, if there are any questions, uh, be happy to answer them. Thanks so much, David. Any questions from Zoom land or from the room? Okay, uh, there being no questions, thanks again. Um, next up, is Pat Kelly again, and this time in his role as the vice president is going to give us news from the board. So Pat, take it away. Okay. Um, all right, share. Okay, news from the board. Uh, first up, we had elections back at the annual general meeting. Uh, so you can find all this on the website, but I thought it'd be helpful just to give everybody just a quick uh, list of who's who. Uh, we have the elected board. Uh, John Nangraves is our new president. Um, over on PEI, where it's probably been as cold and windy the last day or so as we have. Uh, I'm the vice president. Peter Hurley is secretary. And Jamie Wynott has taken over from uh, Greg, whose name escapes me. I keep thinking now is 200% because you always have to blow stuff up when we're doing Zoom meetings on the board. Anyways, Jamie's taken over his treasurer and that's always a tough position to find somebody. So it's, it's nice to have somebody step in. Uh, and for director, Greg, there he's Greg Dill. That's why I couldn't think of his name. Uh, Greg Dill is one of the directors as is Judy Black, who uh, was president last year. Uh, Matthew Dyer, uh, David Hoskins, Tony McGraw and Kathy Walker round out the directors. So those are the elected positions. Um, and then we have a list of appointed positions, which were approved at the last uh, board meeting. So Mary Lou continues as honorary president. She has another two years uh, till that term runs out. Uh, Dave Lane's agreed to be the auditor for the 2022-2023 uh, fiscal year. We have two chairs for the Dark Sky Preserve Committee. I think it's Dark Sky Preserve. Uh, when Judy sent to me, she just had it as DSP. <laughs> So I think it's Dr. Observe, Tony Shelnick and Peter Hurley. Uh, Educations and Public Outreach Chair, David Hoskins. Uh, Judy is chairing the Governance Committee. Uh, uh, she likes doing paperwork, what can I say? <laughs> and she's very good at it. Uh, Jerry Black is our librarian. Uh, Judy's also National Council Rep. Uh, and if that's actually not enough of a task, she's also the chair of the National Council. Um, and I think I'm partly guilty for convincing her to at least be the National Council Rep. That she just sort of said, oh, they've got paperwork to do. I think I'll just uh, start writing the whole thing in a more organized fashion. And she's been doing a great job at it. Uh, nomination Committee Chair is Peter Hurley. So that's for the upcoming uh, any vacancies that come up during the year and for looking for a new board in the fall. The Northeast Planning Committee, uh, Chris Young is taking over as chair of that. And we're very glad that uh, Chris is getting more actively involved in Nova East again. Uh, we have the Nova East, Nova Notes team of Lisa Ann Fanning as editor, John McPhee as the copy editor. 
Dave Hoskins is our observing chair, and John Ledard is our manager at the St. Croix Observatory, making sure that everything with here is working properly. Uh, regarding Nova Notes, there's a couple of things for the upcoming issue. Uh, as has already been mentioned, Terence Dickinson uh, died back on February the 1st. Uh, so if anybody who's in the center either has those of them um, or anecdotes, we're going to sort of put that into the next issue. And I've been going through um, the pictures, the official pictures that were taken when we hosted the last General Assembly here. Terence was actually in, uh, in attendance. Uh, so we will have some from there. But if you have pictures of Terry uh, or or stories uh, from, from uh, having met them, uh, get those in. Uh, we're doing the same thing with Comet ZTF. So if you took images, we saw lots of those today. Um, and I would suggest putting as much detail and, uh, into the, um, the data that goes with the picture, because I know as an editor, it's easier to cut stuff out than it is to make stuff up to fill it in. So if you can include things such as the, you know, the time, uh, the type of camera you used, uh, anything else that would be great. And you can send your submissions for to Nova Notes Editor at halifax.resc.ca. And a very specific deadline, midnight on February the 18th. So anything else you would like to get uh, included in the next issue of Nova Notes, uh, that's the deadline and that's the email address. The Astro Imaging Contest for this year, you've got lots of time. Uh, Judy just gave me November 11th. I decided to add the midnight to it as well, just in case. I probably should have included Atlantic whatever time we're on uh, that time of the year. But lots and lots of time to get pictures and submit them for the contest. Judy's already mentioned we have stuff to buy. Uh, we do have the Observer's calendar for this year, still $25. Uh, and you can either purchase it by emailing treasure at halifax.resc.ca, $25 for one, 50 for two, 100 for three. <laughs> Make sure you put your name and mailing address in the notes when you e-transfer it so we know where to mail it to and we know who it's from. If you want to send a check, you can also do the same thing by mailing a check along with a note to explain what the payment is for. Uh, and our mailing address can also be found on our website. In the center stars uh, for, uh, for this edition, uh, first one up is Dave 17 Chapman. He's the 17th member of the RASD, the Royal Astronomical Society of Daves. Uh, and he's getting honorable mention for a picture of a comet uh, which appeared and was spotted by the hawk eyes of Judy Black um, in the January 31st issue of Earth Sky News. And this is a picture of a comet that is not comet ZTF. It's comet C2022E3. And in fact, Dave Chapman didn't, uh, he was the one who actually took the picture. The robotic telescope at St. Mary's took the picture. He asked it to do it. And he does give a credit in the, there's a credit in the story. To thanks to Dave Lane for uh, setting up the robotic telescope to allow people to actually take pictures of comets uh, when they don't have the equipment themselves. Speaking of Dave Lane, uh, he's Dave Eight Lane. He's the eighth member of the RESD and Tiffany Fields. And I, I particularly want to thank them because they got the listservs back up and running again. So you may have noticed that you haven't been getting announcements for the last six months. Uh, that's because there were new security systems and computer systems uh, that were, went into effect at St. Mary's University. And it took a while for them to work out a way where we could still keep our center board list, the Rascals discussion list, and the membership announcements list, uh, and keep them local here as opposed to trying to run them off of the national systems. And I can now edit them. In fact, just the other day, I added 20 new people who had signed up with memberships uh, from the last time that the list was updated. So if you're wondering why you weren't getting any announcements about stuff, now you know, and that, that's been fixed, and we should be good to go. And the third center star, which is not a Dave, uh, is Jason Dane. And again, this, uh, this was sent to me by uh, either Judy or Lisa. I think it was Lisa. Lisa Ann sent it. Uh, this is a picture of W134. 
and it was submitted to the 2022 Up to Long Deep Sky Astrophotography Competition. And Jason came in third place out of 670 entries from around the world with this image. So congratulations to Jason. Um, picture was taken in July 26th, and that is an absolutely amazing, amazing image. And last but not least, uh, just a reminder of the upcoming uh, events. We have members meetings, uh, March, April, and May, and June, none in July and August, because we don't do that in the summer. Uh, September and October are shifted, um, but they're not the Labor Day weekend and they're not the Thanksgiving Day weekend. And November 4th and December 2nd is the annual general meeting. And these meetings will be held at both at St. Mary's and on Zoom. Uh, technical issues notwithstanding. So there'll be hybrid meetings. And that means that they'll also be recorded. So if you do happen to miss one, you'll be able to look at it uh, on the site uh, a couple of days after the actual meeting itself. The other two big events for the summer are the Kejim Kujik Dark Sky Weekend, which is being held, oddly enough, at Kejim Kujik National Park, uh, the nights of August 11th to 13th. And shortly thereafter, uh, we're hosting the 2023 edition of Nova East on uh, the nights of August 18th to the 20th, the new moon being on August the 16th. So you might get a hint of a very nice thin crescent moon um, in the early evening uh, during Nova East this year. And that is news from the board. Thanks, Pat. Well done. You are welcome. Uh, any questions for Pat from Zoomland or here in the room? Oh, this is weird. There's like a three second delay between the time I do something here and the time I see it on the screen. <laughs> okay, there being no questions for Pat, I believe uh, our president would like to say a few words. So John, I'll hand the screen over to you. Uh, under your mute. Ah, uh, my mute's undone. <laughs> Um, thanks, Pat, for putting that together and reporting it and all of the above. Um, I just want to start with some thanks, Pat, of course. Um, Judy, which you probably don't know how much time she spends on our center's behalf but it's a lot. And um, thank you for being our, our uh, live and in-person MC. Uh, of course, it's a very uh, important job. Um, and thank you for being my right-hand person and savior on many occasions uh, with respect to uh, everything from center operations to um, <laughs> keeping me updated with, or bringing me up to date with uh, much of the goings on of late, um, which have been a lot. Um, Paul, your poem is touching and poignant memorial um, for Terence. It was tr tr truly uh, a beautiful poem. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on that note, my 1989 night watch. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, the board and committee members for their tireless efforts um, and of course support on my part, um, the professionalism that I see with um, the board, the committees, the members um, of our center uh, far exceeds what I've experienced at a professional level. Um, they're spectacular. Um, all the presenters, thank you um, for keeping us entertained and informed. Uh, Tech support guys, I know you have some challenges. Some challenges, way to go! Um, and of course, you, the attendees, the membership, because you make this all worth doing. 
Um, and as far as the actual report of activities on the board, uh, we've had two meetings, um, most of which, uh, aside from just day-to-day -day activities, um, has been regarding the national board situation, uh, which you've all heard something about. Um, I, along with many others just want to point out that there is a lot of disinformation out there there is a lot of misinformation out there so be careful of where you get your information because a lot of it is not true um basically on that situation um we're reining it in um now is the time to rebuild it's not the time to lay blame and bellyache and all that sort of stuff. Um, I don't think that we have the time uh, through financial constraints to actually get everything resolved um, if every decision that the board has made in the last some number of years um, will have to be questioned and justified. We are, we being the presidents and the national council members, which are appointed by the centers. And so they represent the centers at the national level. We are questioning and drilling down and a lot of reading. Um, and as I said, now is the time to rebuild. Blame can be, it's pointless. It's pointless being blamed. I just wanna lay any rumors that anybody has absconded with funds. No, there has been none of that. There has been nothing illegal, immoral, unethical. Um, things are being questioned, answers are being given, um, and it's uh, a lot of information to digest, but ultimately we have to get the ship on an even keel uh, before it's too late and we lose our national office, um, which we do rely on for many things. Uh, so I just want to you know, let you members know that there's a lot of stuff out there that is just not true. There's a whole bunch of people surmising and some of them intentionally rocking the boat. Um, it isn't that. Uh, the legitimacy by which um, the financial issues have come about um, was honest, forthright, uh, I'm sure most of it was a good decision at the time. I'm sure some of it wasn't. There's always going to be somebody questioning somebody about decisions. But realistically, um, it's just bad luck, bad timing, potentially some bad decisions. At the time, they weren't bad. Um, so I just want to let everybody know that... Uh, we, the presidents and the council members, um, are fervently trying to get to the root of the issues and uh, get the growth going well so that we don't continue along this financial difficulty path um, and make it happen. Um, there's no blame, uh, you can blame, but it doesn't make any difference in the end. Um, we have to you know, grab our little toolboxes, get in there and start building again because there's things that need to be fixed. Um, and uh, Judy has been a tremendous, tremendous help um, as the chair of the national board. I cannot tell you how much <laughs> paperwork. <laughs> As everybody knows, she seems to like it, sucker for punishment. Um, she has been doing and as well as communicating with directors, presidents, 
everybody. She's been a tremendous help uh, for our center as well as um, the National Council. Uh, so vis-a-vis -vis all the other centers. Um, uh, I don't really think there's anything um, that I want to say about that. Um, uh, this is the, this, I guess this is my first time on camera as president. Um, it's an honor, of course, to be nominated as president. Um, and we'll, uh, we're moving very fervently to get things rolling much smoother <laughs> for our center, as well as helping the RASC center as we can, or the national center, I'm sorry, the national center as we can. Um, so thank you all for understanding. Thank you all for attending. Thank you all for presenting. Again, Paul, that was beautiful. Um, and I bid you all clear skies, though it only seems to be when it's minus 42 that the sky is clear. So thank you very much and have a wonderful weekend. So, uh, oh. <laughs> thanks, John, uh, for the kind words. Uh, and yes, I seem to be a glutton for punishment when it comes to um, opening my mouth and asking a few questions. I get roped into things. But nonetheless, um, just for a little bit further explanation regarding John's comments regarding the National Council, I'm the chair of it, not the board. <laughs> um, just one meter? How's that? Uh, sorry. Um, and we do meet tomorrow afternoon. It's a joint meeting of the presidents and National Council reps, along with board members, to look at uh, the fiscal status of the RASC and to go forward with a plan uh, to make sure that we are fiscally sound. So you'll hear more from us in the coming months, um, just to let you know. But otherwise, thanks to everybody uh, here in the room, as well as to those of you out there in Zoom land from across the country and from our members down there in the States in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Uh, glad you could join us today. Also want to thank SMU for allowing us this wonderful space to be able to host this meeting and the facilities here. Uh, I want to thank Gary Welsh and Pat Kelly for being our guests today. Uh, very insightful uh, speeches they both gave and interesting how common they were in terms of uh, talking about stars and the rotations around each other. And thanks to our three IT guys, Dave Lane, Jerry Black, and Bob Russell uh, for making this possible. So join us next time, March 4th, Soldier's Day. Ha uh ha, -huh, pun, March 4th. Uh, but anyway, you'll, maybe you'll remember it. So March 4th, same time, same place. Farewell. <laughs>